Um, hello, everybody, and welcome to today's uh, pedestrian focus webinar. Uh, today's webinar is the first episode of our new 12-part series called Countermeasure Strategies for Pedestrian Safety. Uh, and so today's uh, first episode is going to focus on crossing islands and raised medians. Um, the presentation today is going to be delivered by Demian Miller. Uh, Demian's a principal with Tyndall Oliver and Associates. Uh, my name is Dan Jolene, and I'm going to be facilitating the webinar today. Um, I'd like to ask first off if the attendees, if you can hear me, uh, please kick, uh, click the hand icon that's located in the upper right corner of your screen to put your hand up, and uh, hopefully I'll see some hands being raised. All right. Looks great. Looks like everybody can hear me okay. Thanks again for joining us today. We're really excited about this webinar series. We've been planning this for some time, and we're glad that you all are able to join us for the first episode. Hopefully, uh, the first of, of 12 episodes, you'll be able to attend all of them. So um, well, with that out of the way, I wanted to go ahead, uh, before we get into the presentation today, go over a few administrative details um, about the functionality of the webinar software. Um, if your computer freezes for some reason during the webinar, uh, please just reload the website log back into the program, you should be able to just pick up where you left off. Um, we'll be posting the presentation slides and a recording of the webinar on our PBIC uh, webinars website after the fact. So you will be able to look back at anything that you miss. Um, the presentation slides are available right now if you go to that, uh, that website uh, where you found the registration information. Um, the archive, the video recording should be available. I'd say in about one to two weeks. It takes us a little bit longer to put that up, but that will be available after the fact if you'd like to refer back to it. Um, just note uh, during the webinar that the attendees, you won't be able to speak. Uh, however, you will have the ability to submit uh, questions and comments using the chat function uh, throughout the webinar itself. So uh, feel free to send those in to us at any time. Uh, we are going to hold about 20 to 30 minutes for a discussion period after the, um, after the webinar uh, presentation is finished. Uh, so we'll get to as many questions during that time as you can. And um, many of you, when you registered, submitted questions in advance, which is very helpful to us. We kind of see what your priorities are and see what issues uh, you're interested in. Uh, later today, you're going to be receiving a follow-up email uh, from the UNC Highway Safety Research Center um, that will include a link that will allow you to generate a certificate of attendance for this webinar. Um, so if you are attending the webinar with multiple attendees, at your site, and you're the one who registered, uh, you'll be getting that email. Uh, and it'll be your job to forward that information around to the others who registered or who attended with you so that they can all print off their certificate of attendance. Uh, that'll allow you to self-report your professional development hours uh, or however you uh, tend to do that. Um, that. That certificate should allow you to kind of um, uh, show your certificate of attendance for this webinar. So make sure you get that link from the person who registered uh, your group for this webinar. Uh, the email is also going to contain a link to the website where we've posted the presentation materials uh, from today's webinar that I mentioned before. So within one to two weeks, the page will uh, feature a copy of the presentation uh, materials, the video. Uh, like I mentioned before, the slide uh, presentation is already posted for you to go ahead and refer to. Um, and that'll, that link will, again, be in that follow-up email you'll receive later today. Um, we did submit this webinar to the American Planning Association. Uh, to be considered for 1.5 CM credits. Um, I would encourage you, though it hasn't been approved yet, I would encourage you to check their event calendar uh, for when that is approved so you can go ahead and log in and, and claim your planning credits if, you, if that uh, applies to you. Uh, to learn more about the PBIC webinars in general and the other sessions that we have coming up, uh, I'd encourage you to visit headbikeinfo.org slash webinars. Um, Many of you who are attending this session right now saw the full list of webinars that we're going to be offering as part of this series. Um, if you didn't and if you just have registered for this webinar, this is a chance for you to find information about and register for the remaining 11 in the series. I've got the next three sessions that will be coming up uh, posted on this slide that you see now. Uh, there will be many more following that. Um, I'd encourage you. If these are topics you're interested in, uh, to visit that link on the page uh, where there's all the information about all the sessions. Uh, again, these are focusing, these webinars are going to focus on various designs and countermeasure strategies uh, to improve pedestrian safety. So each webinar is going to sort of tackle 
a different design, a different countermeasure, and really get into the details about um, selecting locations, uh, uh, talking about you know how to evaluate these treatments, why they're effective, some case studies. So I'd encourage you, if you're interested, to to, in, to uh, register for all these and maybe distribute the announcement to others uh, who you think might be interested. Thank you, everybody, um, for joining. I, I did not realize this was the first of 12. Um, so if you love it, you should come back for the remainder. And if you think I'm not very good, you should still come back for the remainder because the rest of the people in the program are probably I guess the next slide is to basically provide an overview, uh, Dan, of what we're here to talk about. And as you click through this, the different subject things will come up. Um, normally, we'd ask the class about these. But basically, um, these are all the ways that raised, median, uh, and refuge islands can improve pedestrian safety. Um, the incorporation of a curb extension can help with um, the site triangle and the visibility for the pedestrians, uh, use of a high visibility crosswalk is something we're going to cover. Typically when you're doing a um, you know, median or mid-block uh, type of crossing, uh, the high visibility crosswalks are preferred over just the two lines. We're going to talk about lighting and how uh, the proper lighting design is absolutely critical to, to install one of these safely. Because remember, you know, the same as uh, doctors, I think, uh, if you're working in the traffic safety business, you sort of have that do no harm as your uh, central uh, you know, driving uh, tenant. And so we never want to try to install something to make it safer to cross and then find out we've led people into an unsafe situation. So lighting is key for that. Um, we're going to talk about the placement of the stop bar or in some states where the, the law is different, the, the yield line and, and the relevance and need for that, um, how this works with bicycle lanes, um, the way we correspond with the zone system, the sidewalks. There are a lot of aspects of this where, where we talk about, you know, this is not an ADA um, seminar, but we're going to talk about how the, the parameters of ADA and the PROAG uh, really influence um, and, and um, set parameters for the design of uh, refuge areas. And then finally, um, you know, the importance of the raised island and different design features of that and how you deal with it. So this is sort of the, the high-level summary of what we want to talk about. Um, you know, why basically do we care? Why are these things safe to begin with? And, and the most fundamental reason is that the, the median refuge breaks up a complex crossing into two simpler ones. Um, and, and having that raised median is more important than, than just having, you know, maybe somebody standing out in a two-way left turn lane because um, it provides a sense of shelter and comfort. And so they're more likely to be uh, more patient when they make the second leg crossing and use better judgment. And um, we'll talk about that a little bit more, too. But basically, medians of pedestrian crossing islands and urban suburban areas are one of Federal Highway Administration's nine proven safety countermeasures. So this is something that, based on national experience, we know works. And uh, it's important to the Federal Highway Administration to, you know, to share this information uh, throughout the country. Um, so it's a proven best practice. And you can see the link there to that site. Um, basically, installing raised medians um, is shown to have a 25% reduction in pedestrian crashes in a Florida study, 46% uh, in pedestrian crashes, crashes at sites with marked crosswalks, and a 39% reduction at sites with unmarked crosswalks in a sample from 30 U.S. states. So somewhere between 25 uh, and 39% um, you know, without crosswalks and 46% with crosswalks. Now, that's something that we're going to get into, but the idea that, you know, a crosswalk by itself um, does not guarantee safety, and in some situations, a crosswalk without um, other features such as a raised median or, or other, um, you know, warning devices and things can actually make a situation less safe. And so this is, a raised median is one critical way that we can make marked crosswalks um, improve safety in areas where otherwise they might either have neutral or even negative uh, consequences. And so the overall idea is that installing a refuge island, um, you know, can have up to a 56% reduction in pedestrian crashes. So you see a lot of different numbers. Um, I guess it tells you it's somewhere between 25 and 56%. But even uh, the more conservative number in Florida, I think, is a substantial safety improvement. And so, um, you know, it's something that merits consideration. Next slide, please. So when to install, um, you know, mid-block locations where the crossing exceeds 60 feet. If you think about 60 feet, uh, typically that means, you know, it's uh, at least four-lane road with a median, uh, usually. You could have uh, on-street parking or something else to make up that distance. 
and you're looking for areas where there are a limited number of gaps in traffic. So typically these are going to be um, you know, higher volume roadways where you can't just wander and cross the street at will. Um, they can also be used on local roadways uh, that have lower speeds and volume because there may be uh, special generators like, like schools or hospitals or things like that and also just for aesthetic reasons um, and the, the ability to maybe even uh, create a little bit of a traffic calming benefit. Um, really suitable on collector streets with moderate to high volumes, um, but on multi-lane arterial streets, really high volume, higher speed streets, um, median refuge is, is desirable, but if this is going to be used as a, a marked crosswalk location, then supplementary traffic control devices are almost always necessary. Uh, the crosswalk, just to, the painted crosswalk by itself is usually not going to do the trick on a multi-lane arterial street. So then you can see the reference there, the Ashto guide at the bottom. Okay? So the idea here is that the, the general guidance is that on uh, curb, so what we call urban, uh, typical sections of multi-lane roadways, urban suburban areas, so not necessarily a, a rural roadway thing. Um, and, and you're looking for areas where there's mixtures of significant pedestrian and vehicle traffic. So what we typically would say is more than 12,000 ADT, uh, which is really, you know, any time that you need more than two lanes, you're probably looking at, at that sort of a volume. And any immediate or higher travel speed, so, you know, 35, 40, 45 miles an hour in, in that range. Okay. So just some other parameters. Um, the idea that if the speeds are low, the volumes are low, it's a narrow cross-section, the, the OK column there on the left, uh, relatively low pedestrian volume. You know, the idea here is that putting in an island is OK. You can do it if you want to. It's not necessarily something you have to do, nor is it going to cause um, you know, any sort of problems. If it's a little bit higher speed in the middle there, uh, slightly higher volumes in that 9 to 15,000 range, more lanes, uh, more than 20 pedestrians an hour crossing, uh, and maybe some crash history, then it's something you really need to look at and consider. Um, you know, typically the reason why you wouldn't do it is if you don't have that painted median. Uh, maybe you have uh, business access impacts that are going to be caused, uh, some, some contraindications that, that maybe make it infeasible, but generally this is something you'd want to start looking at. And then if it's, um, you know, but still if there's not a high pedestrian volume, but if you go uh, and you have higher speeds, higher volumes, um, you know, wide road, seven or more, so basically a six-lane road with a, with a median, painted median, uh, more than 20 pedestrians per hour, uh, you know, established crash history, then, then you really need to get on with it and you need to figure out how to reconcile, um, you know, the access issues and things like that. I know, um, you know, in, in Florida at least where, where I practice, um, it's been a statewide policy that they looked at all of their six-lane roads with two-way left turn lanes and worked to make those um, either have raised medians, uh, not necessarily just for pedestrian refuge, but also for access management considerations. And so that's almost a, 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 at a policy level when you start talking about those sorts of speeds, volumes, and typical sections. And um, in terms of warranting criteria, just at the bottom real quick, sorry, Dan, um, you know, different states have different guidelines for that, that, that 20 pedestrians an hour um, seems to be um, something that, that is common. It uh, correlates pretty well with the uh, criteria for pedestrian hybrid beacon. And then it just depends how many hours of a day you need to look at that, uh, depending on what you're trying to put out there. OK, sorry. So uh, we're going to do a couple of case studies as we go through this. This first one is in Eureka, California. You've got sort of a, a, a wide three-lane road, there's no marked crosswalks, um, the intersection is near a curve, and that's important. Um, you know, when you, when you think about the ability of a pedestrian to be able to see uh, in a sufficient distance um, to be able to, to basically get that clearance interval across the street, how curves can affect that. Um, the idea was that this area was avoided by pedestrians, cyclists, and motorists, um, but there's been more traffic and that's led to more collisions and that this is the highest crash uh, intersection in the city. So kind of a, a nasty problem, it looks like. So next slide. And so this was the solution. Uh, they worked with um, Caltrans and the community, which is Caltrans is California DOT, basically, but they have a fancy name because California. And um, 
you know, first temporary traffic controls were used to test the measures. And this is something you can do. Uh, some, some states will do this, other states get nervous about that. But, um, you know, basically the problem was recognized that there had been some realignment of, of other state highways. More traffic was there and they needed to do something. And gaming it out with, with cones or um, we have, um, you know, the other device are sort of these, um, they're used for maintenance of traffic, but they're the, um, the batons or, or um, you know, quick curb is one trade name. There are different devices that can be put out there on a semi-temporary basis to create the structure you're looking for and, and game it out a little bit. Um, ultimately, a median island and crosswalk was installed for, um, you know, but it's basically to define where to cross and then also to provide a refuge. And then other islands uh, were used also. And then the street lighting was enhanced with, uh, with LED signs. Street lighting was enhanced and LED signs were also installed to, to provide for greater visibility both, you know, the lighting to provide visibility, but then the signage to, to alert motorists what was going on out there. So sort of a series of improvements. And, and go on. And so this is what the permanent solution looked like. So they took, you know, the cones, tested it out, made sure everything worked, and then came back in with, with the old brick and mortar and got the permanent thing uh, put in here. And so this reduced both the, um, bicycle and pedestrian conflicts, but also you can see it, it limited uh, what could be done at this intersection for drivers. Some of the direct left turning movements were prohibited and uh, consequently the, the automobile crashes uh, associated with that were reduced as well. And so I think the lesson here is that, you know, the focus of um, the Focus Cities and Focus States program is pedestrian safety, but out there when we're practicing the field, we're looking at all modes. We're looking at the safety of motorists, we're looking at, at transit, we're looking at cyclists. And so this is a situation where doing the right thing for the pedestrians also um, was integrated with and, and helped to reduce motor vehicle crashes overall, which I think is important. And miraculously, uh, not only did it reduce the crashes, but it, it cut them to zero. And then, um, you know, new school, business, and housing uh, increased foot traffic activity. Now, this is something really neat. We've seen this uh, before, and when, and when we do the uh, road diet module uh, later on, you'll see data presented that shows that when you um, go ahead and, and do the right thing and create a design that works for the pedestrians, you can actually um, see latent demand in an area manifest as actual real people, which tends to be good for business and good for the community. So I think it's neat that you know, on one hand we've got a, a overall motor vehicle traffic safety benefit, but we also have this other community benefit that, that can be realized by good design for pedestrians. Okay, moving along. All right, so where to put the islands? And over on the side, in really small print, it says, you know, you need to think about turning movements and access management. Um, these are, this is Dubai in this slide. Um, just a side note, everybody thinks Dubai is amazing for making these palm trees and then the world over there on the side. But if you ever look at Cape Coral, Florida, um, you know, we did it in the 60s without GPS, so who on you, Dubai? But anyway, I don't know why there's Dubai, but it looks cool. But what we want to talk about is median placement. Um, so, you know, at the most fundamental level, um, you know, where there is room, where you have an adequate cross-section. Um, sometimes you can get right away, sometimes you can't. But even when you get right away, remember we talked that this is mostly going to be an urban or suburban application where you have uh, streets that have uh, curb and gutter systems. And that means that even if you have the available right of way um, to maybe squeeze a median in where you, where you don't squeeze a, a refuge island in where you don't have a painted median, um, now you're talking about um, basically reconstructing probably a quarter mile of street be before you deal with the tapers and everything to deal with the transition. So for the most part, and sometimes that may be necessary, that we looked at a project uh, in Tampa where we did recommend uh, going in and reconstructing the curb and gutter system because it was such a, a necessary crossing point. But nine times out of ten, you're really looking for opportunities where uh, you don't have to reconstruct the road to do it. So just where there is room is important. The other thing that's important uh, is where people are crossing. You know, you can, you can put medians in for aesthetic reasons without there being pedestrians, but in the context of what we're talking about today, we want places um, you know, where there's a need. And then they can be done at intersections or mid-blocks. I know um, 
when we're dealing with four and, and oftentimes six lane arterial streets with 30, 40, 50,000 cars a day, we tend to think of uh, any location that's an unsignalized location as being a mid-block. And we sort of uh, functionally treat them all the same. But there are differences, uh, you know, specifically in terms of what you have to deal with for access. And then legally in most states, there's a difference between a pedestrian crossing at an unsignalized intersection versus a mid-block. So we want to bear those in mind. So these are the, uh, the types of you know, locational considerations at, at the highest level. Uh, next slide, please. So this shows you an example, again, of where um, dealing with the pedestrian crossing also has an access management uh, component. And sometimes that access management component can be an advantage uh, because you're also trying to solve a motor vehicle safety issue, um, or maybe it's a neighborhood traffic calming, or whatever the reason. Sometimes though, the access management issue uh, can be a constraint where, where you really need to preserve the access. And so that depends either way. Um, the key point here is that when this, this is a school site um, towards the, the bottom right of the, the slide. And um, you know the key issue here is that installing the median the way they did. So this crosswalk, you can imagine, um, if the desire line is that the students are going to um, start from the right of the slide, and they're going to walk along that sidewalk. And so, yeah, thank you, Dan. Perfect with the mouse. They're going to come along the sidewalk, and they're going to want to cross here. And so it's a, um, a convenient point for the desire line to put the crosswalk. And that's very important. Pedestrians, as I think most of you probably know, are very, very adverse to outer direction travel. And so um, you know, aligning the crosswalk with their desire line is critical. And if not, you may need to consider channelization elements to get them to, to detour to use the crosswalk. In this case, the crosswalk is placed with the desire line. You probably could have shifted it a little bit uh, to the bottom of the slide, still maintained uh, that pathway, and, and preserved more access at that intersection. But the designers chose to do it this way because that, um, for the sake of argument, we're going to assume up is north. So that westbound left turn movement, where you see the no left turn signage, that turn movement would have created a conflict with pedestrians um, you know, crossing uh, the southbound or the left side of the road. And so by designing the median in such a way that it also prohibited that westbound left turn, while nonetheless preserving the southbound left turn uh, onto the street, you achieve not only the best alignment of the crosswalk uh, for the convenience factor, but also you uh, prohibit the conflicting left turn that, that cre create a hazard for pedestrians in the crosswalk. Now, we can assume that there is an alternative pathway for those vehicles to go, that there's a different street that they can take out, and that the circulation needs of the site were preserved overall. Um, but that's, that's sort of an additional feature that we want to point out in terms of location. All right, next slide. So this shows another example where, um, where the left turns are uh, out of one driveway are prohibited or restricted, uh, but they're preserved from another location. And so um, you know, the main difference here is that the, uh, you know, it depends uh, state to state how you deal with it. But um, you know, whether or not you're using that, that center two-way left turn lane or median area, if you're using it um, to enable drivers along the main road to decelerate and then make a left turn out of the median, or if you also want to use it to allow drivers making a left turn from a side street to make a two-stage left turning movement where they first turn into the median and then accelerate into the travel lane. So in this situation, it's a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, you, you have different left turning movements here. Uh, this median placement uh, really restricts the, the left turn out of the driveway to the north. Um, it does not permit, uh, it does not restrict the left turns out of the two driveways um, you know, to the right side of the slide. However, it would prohibit, um, if you were making a left turn out of the, the bottom driveway, you couldn't lay over in the median. You'd have to make a direct left turn into the, into the uh, for our purposes, the westbound lanes. And at the same time, um, you could still possibly, although it's not striped as a left turn lane, um, you know, so, so there are different things here. You could, you could potentially use the, the median area to, to make a left turn into the driveway on the bottom, 
but not into the driveway on the top. So the point here is, is that the installation of this median refuge has uh, not entirely restricted left turn movements, uh, but it has compromised uh, some of them. And, and that's always a trade off is, you know, what is, what's more important? Uh, who can navigate this more safely? What is the pedestrian demand? And, and you know, making the, the best of the compromises. Everything we're doing here, when we're not designing new roads uh, or, or complete reconstruction projects, typically we're going to be dealing with compromise. And so this is just showing you how to consider those things and acknowledge it and then get on with life. Okay, uh, next slide. So this just shows uh, potential driveway conflicts. And the idea here is that, uh, and, and we've got a couple of these that sort of illustrate this, but the idea is that, is that you can place these medians uh, without limiting access or without completely restricting it. You may uh, complicate it a little bit, but it can be done. Uh, this median you're seeing in this picture is probably about a, the median refuge. I'm sorry, I keep kind of going back and forth between terminology. But the, the refuge island you see here is really about as small as you'd want one to be. Um, but sometimes you, know, you, you get a little bit tight with these things because you're trying to fit one in in a critical location. Uh, without constraining access too much. And so this is an example of, of getting one in uh, where you still preserve opportunities for drivers to get in and out of uh, businesses. And at the same time, it's very important to consider um, those driveway movements, whether they're left turns or right turns, where that turning traffic is going to um, then cross through the crosswalk area and, and managing those conflicts with the pedestrians as well. And so uh, let's see what we've got next here. So just, you know, this is looking at the same example where the driver is uh, preparing to turn left. And I think we can kind of move through these. This shows how, um, you know, they can get out there. And if they choose to, they can still use that two-way left turn lane area as a, uh, as a layover. In this case, so the driver doesn't need to. They go ahead and make a direct left turn into traffic. Uh, in the next slide, we see another example. In this case, uh, even so, there is a median there. Uh, median island, uh, a driver can still sneak in and use uh, the two-way left turn lane to stage, uh, to make a left turn into the, the business that's just sort of off, off stage right. And so you've got that opportunity as well. And even if they're telling a trailer, they can do that. And so, um, you know, the idea here is that, is that we used to have a tendency to say, oh, this is a, a four or six lane divided road. Uh, we need to make it uh, instead of a two-way left turn lane, we've had some crashes, we've got pedestrians. We need to make it a uh, you know, restricted median. We're going to put a raised median up and down it, and we're going to completely blow up access, but that's what we have to do. And I think the message here is that you can achieve most of the benefit, um, for pedestrians at least, with well-placed islands. Um, if you want to restrict access, you're probably doing it for a different reason. But, but one mustn't think that, that solving the pedestrian issue means that you have to completely tie up the entire median with, with raised uh, median. You can use well-placed islands and achieve most of the benefit. Um, another thing you need to consider in the next slide is um, the length of the opening to the next median and, and uh, in the slide after this, Dan, uh, when you think about uh, you know U-turn radii and things like that. So again, if you're if you're um, if you're shutting down uh, part of a median with a raised island, and it's more than just a, a small little island like we just showed you, but you actually are creating some uh, restricted median access, you need to make sure that you've um, nonetheless accommodated opportunities for for vehicles to make U-turns uh, and that they can uh, turn out of driveways and, and get onto the street with the median. And so there are turning templates that help you figure that out. And so again, designing, whether you're designing um, a fully restricted median or just putting an island, um, you can look at the design type of vehicle if you need to accommodate uh, just passenger cars. Uh, typically, if you're dealing with retail sites, you're going to need to accommodate uh, delivery vehicles, whether they're single unit or a tractor trailer. And, and thinking about the, the land uses and sort of that design vehicle can help you determine where you can place these refuge islands and, um, and whether or not vehicles can still turn around them and get, and get in and out and do what they need to do. 
So this just shows you the different um, the different radii for different vehicle types. Give me a <clears throat> yeah. could, could, because I think uh, this could, gets onto a good point about working with uh, not only larger vehicles like this, but emergency management and, and emergency response vehicles. I mean, I like the last picture here because yeah. it shows the right. installation right in front of the fire station. So it's, it clearly can be done, and it's not always something emergency you know responders are opposed to. But can you talk a little bit, maybe just briefly, maybe you cover it later too, about just working with EMS as a as a stakeholder group with these things? Yeah, I think I think that's something that that you'll see. Um, particularly if if it's a what's that? Oh. Well, nothing here, Jimmy. Okay, somebody was saying something. Um, typically, if you're if you're working on on a four lane road. Um, you know, EMS can sometimes be concerned if you start if you start putting uh, barriers in a uh, center turn lane. They'll use that center turn lane to um, go out of direction, uh, whether it's to run up uh, to a traffic signal. Uh, and on an, if it's a, a three lane road, you know, a two lane divided roadway, um, they'll use that center turn lane to to pass. Um, as vehicles pull over to the right to let them by, they'll run up the center turn lane to continue on um, where they need to be. And so um, there may be some concern that if you start putting in uh, median islands, raised islands, that you're going to impact their ability to um, to you know run up ahead and and bypass traffic in the event that they have to respond to an emergency. So um, you know in this particular example, you see that that the concern for the, uh, the fire department there might be, can we still make a direct left turn out of our driveway? And obviously, that's sort of a, a health, safety, and welfare concern, I even more important than preserving business access, which, of course, you could get sued over. Um, and this median island was put in place um, to be able to preserve the fact that fire trucks can come out and make a left. But an additional consideration may be that if there is a, a, a fire station or something like that nearby, um, even if the uh, refuge island is not directly in front of their facility, but if it's um, on an approach to a signal that maybe it's pretty common that when they respond, they need to be able to run up uh, the two-way left turn lane to get to that signal and then be able to um, to go go through the signal on red, that 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 might be a consideration in in island placement. And so the main thing is you know advanced coordination, considering their needs. And then working out a design solution that accommodates, um, you know, all all the the users. And so those are you know, less more often it's going to be the second where it's a, a major like a trunk route for them to respond than this direct conflict here. But um, you know, it's just an important stakeholder to consider. And um, you know, there are some designs that allow for um, a flush island using uh, pavers and other treatments uh, with with um, pavement domes and things like that, uh, not ideal, but um, you know those are some things that could be considered in an extreme circumstance where you have to make that compromise work. So hey, thank you so much, Dan, for pointing that out. Um, you know, the next thing is when we say, you know, what type of um, island or, or median, raised median design is appropriate, and uh, you know, the, the Situation usually walking into on the on the top left is a, a flush, a painted median. Um, the most next most common is probably just the standard uh, raised curb, and those can be different curb designs. Some are mountable, some are not. Um, but that seems to be you know what what most folks do. And then um, something interesting we want to show you is a low profile uh, barrier. Actually, and this this has a couple of different purposes. Um, one is for traffic safety. But the other um, ancillary purpose is that it tends to create a disincentive for pedestrians, and particularly cyclists. Um, uh, anybody, with, particularly if there's a stroller or, or you know anything like that involved, um, crossing other than at your designated crossing points. And so um, the low profile, the low, I'm sorry, the low profile barrier can also um, help to achieve uh, some pedestrian channelization. As well, and uh, the, the picture shown here is, is a design from Washington uh, State, and we're going to talk about that some because of those unique advantages. 
All right, on the next slide. So the main point here is that a two-way left turn lane is not a refuge or a crossing island. Um, you know, it's probably better to stand in a two-way left turn lane than to stand on a double yellow line, uh, all else being equal, but it doesn't constitute um, a refuge. It does create an opportunity for a refuge without having to reconstruct roads or narrow lanes or take parking or any of those things that, that can often cause problems. And so I think uh, from a, a planning point of view, and I'm a planner probably, well, I am a planner, I guess, not an engineer. Um, you know, we would tend to look at, at roadways where we had um, higher volumes and we had two-way left turn lanes. We would take a systemic approach and, and triage those and, and see which ones we could put islands on and where. And so we see it mostly as an opportunity. All right, on the next. Oh, there's some animation here. And so, yeah, what I just said, it's just better than standing out there like a jerk on the yellow line, uh, sucking in your tummy and hoping nothing bad happens. All right. So the thing you most frequently see is, uh, you know, a typical standard uh, raised median with a concrete curb. And then in the middle, uh, you know, sometimes it's just grass. Sometimes it's grass with trees and shrubs and other things. Sometimes it's just pavement. Uh, it really depends on what you can afford uh, to put in and what you can afford to maintain. And so, um, you know, the idea here is that is that the width of these is typically determined by the width of, of your median uh, in the first place. For this to be considered as a pedestrian refuge, it needs to be a minimum of six feet wide. So you can have narrower raised uh, medians that have different traffic control purposes, but um, but to be considered a pedestrian refuge, it needs to be at least six feet, and we'll get into why that's the case. Uh, eight feet's better if you want to have bicycles or wheelchairs or scooters and groups of pedestrians. And then um, really the minimum length parallel to the street uh, should be about 20 feet. And that's to provide um, you know, sufficient mass on either end and then accommodate the width uh, needed for the, for the crossing through it. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about some other parameters uh, to do with this later. But um, you know, the next one is the example of the Washington State uh, low-profile uh, barrier wall. And um, you know, the idea here is that, that there's a transition from a traditional six-inch median. Um, this was done in part because there was this gateway, the sale feature. And in order to um, put this in a relatively narrow median, and, and so 45 mile per hour uh, posted speed, there were also a desire to have trees, and, and you can see there's light poles, and there's all sorts of other uh, fixed object hazards in this median area. But with the 45 mile per hour speed, um, it didn't meet the clear zone, and so this low profile uh, barrier curb was designed uh, to accommodate that. And it's important to note uh, with the click of the mouse stand that this uh, pedestrian cut through is not really what we want to show you here. This is, uh, lacks some, some necessary features to meet ADA, and we'll explain more about what's desired uh, for that. So more about the low profile barrier wall. Uh, basically, you see that, that it has the ability to deflect vehicles. Um, it's flush, and then, and then the little uh, camphor thing pops out here. The, the top edge is 20 inches with a 3 half inch lip uh, that, that you know, comes down from the top and uh, it, it protrudes out uh, an inch and a half. So this is basically a lip that's designed um, to come into contact with the, the bumper of your typical uh, passenger car or, or you know, light truck uh, SUV type vehicle. Um, you know, heavy vehicles are going to interact with it differently, but your typical design vehicle of a, a passenger car or, or SUV uh, would interact with the barrier wall in such a way as to deflect rather than and climb over it. And in the uh, next slide, we've got some, uh, you know, th there are more design uh, plan sheets for this in the presentation that are hidden that you can get to uh, either on the Washington State DOT website or they're also going to be in the PDF version of this presentation uh, that you can take away. But basically the idea was that um, this is good for posted speed of 45 or less, so it's not a rural highway, very high-speed design, um, but it, it reduces the risk of uh, 
crossover accidents and then protects vehicles against the fixed objects that are within the median itself. Uh, you could make the case, you know, why I put the fixed objects in, but, um, you know, aesthetics are important and also, um, you know, in this case, preventing against the median crossover crashes is an added benefit. Uh, as I mentioned before, the higher barrier wall can also discourage uh, pedestrians from crossing it at uh, undesignated locations. So this is just a couple of things. Um, if you're just trying to control access, the minimum width of the median can be four feet. Um, this would typically be a two foot wide concrete separator with a one foot um, you know, painted zone on either side of it. Um, but six feet is better. Um, the minimum for a pedestrian is six feet uh, to be considered a pedestrian refuge, but eight feet or, or even more is better. Um, if you want trees, there are some things you can squeeze into six feet. Um, but, but 10 feet is better in terms of, um, you know, root structure and things like that. Um, here we're saying that the minimum for a single left turn lane is 10 feet, and that certainly is true. Um, if you don't have a, a raised separator, uh, you can do 10 feet. If you want to have a raised separator, it's probably closer to 14. Uh, for the most part, though, even a painted two-way left turn lane without a separator, um, I would make the case that maybe the recommended width should be 12. That seems to be sort of a more standard width uh, because it makes it a little bit easier for, for drivers to navigate in and out. But, but 10 feet is certainly uh, acceptable, particularly on a lower speed urban roadway. And then finally, um, this is a thing you don't see everywhere, um, but the idea that you have a left turn lane and a median refuge. So in other words, that the left turn uh, separator also serves as a, a median refuge area. And there you're basically looking at the 10 feet for the turn lane plus the six foot minimum width uh, for the refuge. Although, you know, it depends if you consider the, the painted area on either side, it, it might be closer to 18 as a, as a preferred. And so, um, you know, those are just some sort of very minimum uh, parameters to consider. Um, and again, a lot of times what we do is based on the section, overall cross section available to us. So the idea here is that if you do not have that minimum six foot area that you consider to be uh, acceptable as a pedestrian refuge, then you should not uh, plan for or create conditions where um, the pedestrian cannot cross the road in a single phase of a signal or, or you know, a signal activation of a mid-block crossing device or whatever it is. Um, also important to note that um, you know, there's no way if it's less than six feet, or even if it is six feet, you're not going to go up and over the island. You're going to you're going to stay flush with the roadway, and you would not place detectable warnings because you're you know the detectable warning both tells um, you know a person with a visual impairment that not only are they leaving a place of safety, but when they get to the next one, it tells them that they're reaching a new place of safety. And in this case, of course, they aren't because it's not wide enough to be a viable refuge area. Okay, next. All right, so this just shows some examples. Uh, no truncated domes if less than six feet, and you see that um, pretty well illustrated here throughout. And uh, you know, this would be inappropriate to, to put them in the, in the bottom. If you have between six and 16 feet wide, you know, a, a wider um, refuge, then it's possible. And basically the idea is that you have a minimum uh, two foot requirement for the truncated domes, a minimum two foot clear area and then two feet on the other side. And that's where the six feet comes from, uh, but that's still pretty tight. If you, you know, depending on the speeds and volumes of the traffic, that, that may still feel very uncomfortable. So that six feet, um, you know, I'm editorializing a little bit beyond what the slide says, but the six feet is probably a lower speed, lower volume uh, circumstance where if you're on a higher speed arterial street, um, you know, that six feet isn't something that you, you'd really want to plan for. You, you try to do better. Okay, and so you know the question here is is is, is this okay? What's been done here? And um, you know you can all raise your hands, but the answer is uh, you know no on the first one that that the width uh, of that school crossing is is not wide enough to have the truncated domes. It's not wide enough to be considered. Um, you know there's no gap between the the uh, domes. It looks like maybe if you pushed them all the way to the outside, you could. You can get that two feet inside, so this is borderline. So maybe a poor application rather than 
um, you just insufficient cross section. So we have another example. Um, you know, is this okay? And um, I think what we're saying here is uh, um, that there is at least you know the domes we're going to assume are two feet wide, and we're going to assume there's two feet in between. So we're okay with this one. Um, but you can, and, and I think if you go back to, sorry Dan, I keep messing with you. If you go back here, you can see they've even placed a push button on the uh, beacon in the center. So there's a push button on the outside. But in theory, they are treating this as a refuge. And that's another important feature. Um, if you are going to treat a median island as, as a refuge area, um, and you're going, depending on how you want to time your, your uh, crosswalk signalization, then you also need to put that pedestrian actuation that needs to be accessible for, for somebody with a disability. Um, you know, that needs to also be included in the median as well. Uh, you know, in this case, you've already got the pole, you've already got the flasher, you've already got probably conduit or radio. So putting the additional uh, push button out there, no big deal. Um, I don't know how this particular thing is timed. More than likely, it's timed so that an able-bodied uh, pedestrian can cross the entire street in one interval of the, the flashing beacons, but uh, sometimes you put the supplemental out there in the, in the refuge um, because if there's somebody that's maybe older or, or in a wheelchair or for whatever reason has a mobility impairment, they might not be able to make it all the way across. And, and rather than create more delay for 99% of the traffic or 95 or whatever it is, um, you know, you can have a more balanced uh, situation there. Okay. Um, is this one okay? I mean, it's wide enough, right? But this is, again, just a flawed application of truncated domes. They should cover the entire width of uh, the crossing. There are other things about it. It's a shame, too, because whoever designed this understood how to um, create the alignment with the um, curb faces on the inside for a, a pedestrian who's blind and nonetheless screwed up the truncated dome. So sort of a mixed bag of uh, ADA uh, knowledge here. But these are all little details. OK, so all the examples we just showed you, um, the pass through for the, the pedestrians was flush with the roadway. Um, and we know that for those of you that have snow or sand drifts or you know whatever it is, that those uh, flush pass throughs um, or just messy drivers, um, those flush areas can create maintenance issues. Um, and so when you have um, a wider median that's 16 feet or greater, you now have an opportunity to ramp up and then have a level area in the center. And, and really that 16 feet width comes from the parameters of, of the 8.3% the or one inch per foot slope from ADA. Um, having the center of the median raised has a few advantages. Uh, it gives the pedestrians a six inch better view of what they're looking at so they can maybe see a little further down the line and it makes them more visible because they're effectively a, a larger target for drivers. But um, And also there's some maintenance benefits that, that you don't have to try to get into these little crevices. But the main thing here is that the, the you know, controlling uh, constraint here is, is dealing with the ramp slope for ADA. So what you end up with is that uh, to get up um, four or five inches of curb, you end up with about a six foot long ramp. And um, once you put the two feet on either side for the detectable warnings, and then a four foot clear area in the middle to be able to navigate and, and pivot um, a wheelchair, you add that all up and you know you end up with 16 feet. And they can be bigger, and that's fine. You know, basically, um, you could go with a flatter slope or more likely you just have a larger um, you know, level area in the middle. So this is an example of a, a very generous median. Um, and then you can see also that um, you know, you've got the, this is actually designed to operate as a, a two-stage movement where you've got a pedestrian signal and push button um, in the median. And, and it's really these wider, um, more generous mediums where that practice is, is more acceptable. So I guess technically you can do it in that little six foot thing, but we would really prefer to see it um, done in a wider median such as this. And it's pretty too, there's pavement and somebody spent some money on it. 
Okay. So again, just looking at the at the criteria from the Green Book, um, you've got, and we kind of already covered this, but basically, if you're going to accommodate the four foot landing and the um, and the um, appropriate ramp slopes for a six inch curb height, and you need 16 feet of width. Um, and then you get level. You don't have to necessarily go all the way up. If you don't have the 16 feet, um, you might not. You might have a lower. You might get close to level with the um, rest of the island, but you may still be somewhat depressed. And then, um, really, with a 10 foot um, wide crosswalk, and then to have the necessary radius in the front end, you're typically talking about 20 feet from the nose of the island um, towards the back of the crosswalk. And so. And, and on, on either side to accommodate both the crosswalk and the uh, radius. So 20 feet by 16 sort of becomes your minimum if you want to come up level. And uh, then if you go with the ProAg though, uh, you're looking at a five foot, and so you may have to drop it down a little bit there. I think that's in the next slide, Dan. So here, the uh, refuge island, um, you want the, the clear width of the pedestrian access routes um, within the medians uh, to be a minimum of five feet. So you've got a minimum of five feet wide, but again, you can go wider on this. Um, and then if they're offset, as shown in the center, um, you know, it just needs to meet that criteria for, uh, for uh, two wheelchairs to pass, basically. And so again, just a lot of the design parameters are uh, established through the ADA. I don't know, I feel like we're kind of beating this one to death, but again, this is just illustrating um, the, the run that you need. And this is in metric. Wow. All right. Um, 95.24 inches, technically, but, you know, um, this is just showing that the run that you need to uh, to make it happen, and so, um, and that shows that, that you can accommodate most of it here, but then you can have uh, some slope in the uh, higher curb or flat ramp equals slope. Yeah, okay. So again, this is just demonstrating that that um, that you can accommodate some of the slope. Um, after the ramp, but you still need to get that uh, to come up to the height. So again, that just defines your criteria. Okay. The point is, is that you can weasel down to 15 feet, but six and one. So changing gears a little bit, we talked a lot just now about how um, your ADA requirements are going to set some minimum width if you're trying to have a um, level uh, ramps up instead of a cut through. Um, this is to talk about doing a two-stage crossing. Two-stage crossings uh, have a lot of advantages in terms of balancing um, the progression and efficiency of the movement of the motor vehicles um, with a hot response for pedestrians and, and still providing for um, you know, necessary uh, mid-block or unsignalized crossing um, where necessary. And so the paradox we're always dealing with here is that if you want the pedestrians to comply with the, whether it's a, um, this can be done with a, a full signal or with a pedestrian hybrid beacon type approach. Um, I've not seen it done with a flashing beacon or a rectangular wrapping flashing beacon, although in theory I guess you could, although there's no progression to manage in those cases. But the idea is that um, is that you're trying to balance the need for a hot response for pedestrian, which means that uh, shortly after the pedestrian presses the push button, they get the walk signal. And that's going to make their compliance uh, much higher. At the same time, when you have a hot response for pedestrian, odds are you're completely disrupting the progression along the arterials or collector street. And so um, you know, that has impacts on um, level of service. But I think it's also important to say that when you uh, make a platoon of cars jam on their brakes, um, 
you know, the consequence of that can be rear end crashes. The main contraindication for putting in a signal is, is an increase in rear end crashes. So um, balancing the two things has some advantages. And basically the idea here is that the pedestrian pushes the button. It may not be an instantaneous response, but you're dealing with only one direction of traffic at a time. Uh, you stop that traffic, but you're only stopping the traffic for the interval um, for the pedestrian to cross half the street. And then the pedestrian uh, walks in, into the direction of oncoming traffic and actuates the second crosswalk, and that stops the other direction. This offers more opportunities for your signal timing people to create um, less impact on the, the platoons in each direction, and it creates a shorter uh, pedestrian interval because it's only half the crossing, and, that, and it does not include the, the time to cross the median, so that even if the pedestrian call does disrupt progression along the arterial, it, it's less of a disruption than it otherwise would be. And so this is something that is really, uh, frankly, something I wish we'd see more of uh, throughout the country because it does seem to offer um, a great compromise between those two typical trade-offs. I'm going to show you a couple of examples of, of that being done. Um, this is a really small example, um, you know, but the idea here was that um, we put the railing in to enforce the channelization for the pedestrian. Uh, this is just a regular offset without the signalization. This is an un unsignalized. There's no hybrid beacon. There's no signal. Um, creating this offset also has advantages for the pedestrian. Uh, there's something about having the pedestrian take a few steps into the direction of oncoming traffic that forces them to look up and, and re-verify that they have a, a safe gap or that drivers are going to to yield to them as they cross. And this is about the minimum size you could get away with. Uh, we talked before about 20 feet minimum length. So here you have the two 10-foot crosswalks. So this is barely more than 20 feet long. Uh, in this case, there was a desire to have the, uh, the pedestrian walkway come up to the top of the island. Um, but because of the narrow width, um, and this could only be done you can only accommodate four inches of rise, and so there's still six inches of curb on either end, though, to make it a little bit um, more intimidating for drivers. And then the railing here is to channelize the pedestrian, but it needs to be crash-worthy um, for uh, motor vehicles. Okay, next. Um, this is a more elaborate example, um, and this is showing same thing we showed you in that plan view before, but instead of a full signal, it uses pedestrian hybrid beacons. Uh, again, the point of the pedestrian hybrid beacon was to provide that, that positive walk, don't walk control for the pedestrian, um, you know, a, a, a solid red to initially stop traffic, but then to reduce the overall impact on, on the roadway level service and progression by allowing drivers to proceed on a stop control once the pedestrian, uh, you know, once that initial all red, um, that, that solid red phase had ended. And so taking this and then applying it in a two-stage crossing further manifests that desire to create the best of both worlds between um, a hot response for the pedestrian and yet not totally disrupting flow. And you can see this is a six-lane major arterial important street. Uh, a couple things to point out. Um, this example is in Scottsdale, Arizona, where actually in Phoenix right now, it's very, very hot here, even in October. And so there's shade in the median, and that helps with the pedestrian's willingness to, um, to go ahead and wait for the walk signal to, to be compliant. I saw examples in downtown Phoenix where they actually have shade structures where you push the, uh, the button at the crosswalks. So creating that incentive for the pedestrian. Uh, in Florida, it should be umbrellas and shade. But the idea is that make it easy to do the right thing. Um, but the other thing is there's decorative landscaping here that's designed in such a way it's low. It doesn't block the visibility, but it does create that channelizing element. There's a hundred different ways you can do that. And then also, um, you know, this island does restrict left turning access out of these side street driveways. And so that eliminates some conflicts that would be present if you had just done a conventional crosswalk along either the north or the south side of the intersection. Um, when your pedestrian desire line is at an unsignalized intersection rather than a true mid-block, those conflicts out of that intersection become an issue. And this is one way uh, to solve that um, if you can deal with the access impacts. Um, 
So there. All right. Uh, let's go next. This shows you a smaller example. Um, is this cut through in the top right or wrong? Uh, this is not good. This is similar to the poor example we showed you from the from the um, low profile um, guardrail example. And and the issue with this is that it does not uh, provide somebody that's using a cane to navigate really um, the top one or the one on the on the bottom left to to get lined up. And, and to figure out, you know, how to uh, exit into traffic. And so the bottom right example is uh, better because it, it has that, uh, the, the curb face is perpendicular to the roadway so that um, someone using a cane uh, uh, can get that cue as to, you know, basically the alignment of the crosswalk as they're leaving the refuge area. And that's, that's just this important little detail uh, that needs to be considered as you as you go through these. Um, you know this is okay. Uh, it's a little bit short in the next example, but um, but you know you still it still provides that cue to get across, and so that's just an important consideration when you do that angle cut through. Um, most of the time, if it's unsignalized, the width of the stagger only really needs to be um, the width of the crosswalk. You can do more, um, but the point of the stagger here is really just to make it reinforce the message to the pedestrian that this is in fact a two-stage movement. When you start uh, having a, a wider median, um, then then it's less of an issue. Um, <coughs> and if there's a signal or or a hybrid beacon control, then the stagger is not really as important because now you've got traffic control for the pedestrian. Um, and and they don't really need to be as on their toes because you've given that that red uh, signal to the drivers. If you make the stagger too big, it's likely people are going to ignore it. Um, you know, you can try channelization. Um, we showed the example where where you're you're maybe doglegging across a unsignalized intersection, and there a greater stagger may be necessary. Um, stagger in the median. Is probably a better solution than skewing the crosswalk if you do need to achieve some lateral traverse in your design. Uh, sometimes you might need to put stagger in because you're trying to dodge uh, driveways. And, and so there are these different design constraints on the curb line that may require you to create a skew between your um, two uh, pedestrian ramps on, on either side of the road. And we'd rather see that accomplished by a staggered median refuge island than by a skewed crosswalk, although sometimes you might need to split the difference and do both. In the next slide, um, we'll show you some more things. So then the questions come up before, okay, that's great, guys, but when we do have uh, that two-stage crossing, whether it's with a signal or hybrid beacon, what's the minimum um, offset that's necessary? And this offset is necessary because you do not want um, a pedestrian, as they leave the curb, to to cue off of the walk signal um, on the far side of the road, you, you want them to be sure that they're only cueing off of the walk signal in the median because they're going to be giving two separate messages. So the first way you accomplish this is you make sure that you place your walk signals out of your crosswalks, as shown here. So you see this is the, the wrong thing to do is put them in the middle, where what you're really creating in this case is it's not an offset to help the pedestrian line up or necessarily an offset to accommodate design constraints. It's an offset to make sure that the pedestrian cues off of the correct uh, pedestrian signal. And so, you know, the idea is that, uh, you know, typically 10 to 20 feet is enough to get that done. If you have a design constraint and you have to go less than that, then you want to use uh, louvers or, or, you know, some other uh, visor on your uh, walk signals to help ensure that pedestrians don't accidentally cue off of the wrong one. And so, um, you know, I guess the rule of thumb would be um, width of the crosswalk plus 10 or 20 feet, but, um, you know, more is better. Now, the wider the median, um, you know, the less important this is, and, you know, the wider the street, too. And so, again, this is something that um, you need to use judgment for. Okay. Um, so far, we've talked exclusively about pedestrian refuge islands and uh, roadway medians. 
We also have refuge islands um, that are you know, typically for channelized right turns. And I think the main thing here is that um, a painted, same as a painted two-way left turn lane is not a refuge, a painted uh, right turn channelization island is not a refuge. And, and we're possible, sometimes they're just too small, but we're possible we'd like to see um, our, our best solution is a tighter radii altogether for pedestrians, but sometimes that can't be accommodated uh, often because of, of the need to accommodate uh, larger vehicles. And so then a properly designed raised right turn island uh, can help to simplify those movements. Again, uh, the ramps must be at least four feet wide uh, minimum, but really going towards five feet is, seems to be the way that we're moving. Um, if it's a cut through, it needs to be at least four feet wide so that wheelchairs can pass. Um, a five foot um, clear level turning space, whether it's a cut through or, or a raised uh, pad in the center. And then the two foot strips for detectable warnings. And then basically the idea is that the, the cut throughs or the ramps, whichever you choose, should be aligned um, directly into the crosswalk so that, that they put people into the right direction and, and send you over to the ramps on the other side. And uh, you know, these are good things for, for able-bodied pedestrians and certainly necessary for anyone with a um, visual impairment or anything else. So this just highlights um, sort of the, the minimum standards here. Um, even if you do a cut through, it's a good idea to create some slope for positive drainage. So you see the example here uh, in the bottom. You know, it's, it's, it's such a shame that so often the, the ponding occurs right at the bottom of the place where you're telling people to walk and then they start doing different things. And so creating a little bit of positive drainage there, and you can see how the concrete, the asphalt has been sort of added below. And, and that's just, you know, that's good construction. Somebody designed it, somebody built it, and somebody came back and said, oh, we need to fix it a little bit. And presumably they're, um, you know, the lips here are within tolerance for, for ADA. So it's just a design consideration. Um, in terms of landscaping, the main thing here is that don't let uh, your landscape architect's aesthetic vision, uh, you know, impinge on safety for your pedestrians. So moving along, um, obviously it, lo it looks better with trees and such, but uh, basically you want, uh, if you're doing trees, you need to deal with a clear zone, uh, but from the standpoint of um, of um, you know, visibility, you want narrower trunks, uh, particularly in a narrower median where there's not a lot of room on either side of the tree. So you don't want the, the tree trunks to obscure um, a pedestrian crossing. You want to trim the low branches so that the canopy is above the pedestrian. And then if there's bush in the median, these you want to keep low. Uh, this is kind of common sense stuff, but a lot of times it, it goes haywire. We have a propensity for putting uh, palm trees in our medians, which are neither frangible nor particularly narrow, and I don't understand it. Uh, in Florida, but somehow that caught on. Uh, next slide. So location and type, uh, narrow medians can make it tough to maintain. Uh, visual obstructions for turning motorists are also a consideration. You know, think about how high that person in the passenger car is, and then roadside um, you know, fixed object hazards. So all that stuff, pretty common sense, uh, but something to consider definitely when you're designing your, your median refuges. Okay. Um, for some non-signalized mean opening, uh, nothing over 30 inches within 50 feet of the opening. Um, and so a lot of times you'll see designers go to more of a hardscape or a, a very low ground cover type of shrub there. No trees within 50 feet for non-signalized. Uh, the second tree should be no closer than 100 feet from the first because that creates, it can create a wall when you're looking at it from a diagonal. And then nothing between two and six feet. So that area where you, where you that clear area you need to be able to see. Uh, at a traffic signal, then you still have um, the 50-foot rule for anything over 30 inches, no trees within 100 feet, um, same spacing for the second tree, and then the same uh, criteria. And so all of these criteria that apply to medians in general, um, signalized and unsignalized locations also apply for pedestrian crossings is the point here. And this is from Phoenix. Um, NCHRP report 612 talks about the guidelines for safe and aesthetic roadside treatments. It's also um, Chapter 10 of the Roadside Design Guide. Okay. So um, you know, this just looked at some different analysis of um, 
of um, crashes for a few different case studies. We looked at 140 miles of urban uh, arterial roads, five years of data, and uh, videotaping to identify the characteristics, uh, the traffic characteristics for things occurred and didn't occur. And you've got uh, these different states and different examples. And uh, let's take a look at them. These are all studied in the NCHRP report we just mentioned. And so um, this talks about the lateral distance of, um, of the landscaping features, uh, the fixed diving hazards from the curb. And you can see that, that um, you know, once you start getting past about four feet, so this is cumulative, and it's saying that basically 80% of the crashes occur with fixed objects less than four feet from the curb. So that four-foot distance uh, seems to be a pretty big, sort of an 80-20 rule um, breakpoint. So you know, don't put stuff within four feet. Um, and then, you know, over 90% of the crashes uh, were six feet or less. So if you can go more than six feet, you're you're in pretty good shape. All right. So this is just you know more information about rigid objects um, and narrow landscape buffers. Um, you want to basically get things. Don't put things immediately adjacent to sidewalks and opposite. Um, place poles, light stands, or other large objects immediately adjacent to the sidewalks or an opposite side of the sidewalk, although immediately adjacent would seem to put it closer to the street. But, um, but basically the idea is don't, don't put it, if you've got a, a, this is a planning strip along a sidewalk, basically, duh, try to keep your fixed objects as far from the street as you can do, um, which is sort of a common sense thing. All right. This is examples of non-compliant uh, raised island designs. And we're going to show you why um, in a minute. But the basic idea here is that when you have that, uh, that low six-inch curb and then the raised planter boxes or barriers, whatever you want to call them, um, it creates a pretty specific crash hazard, which I think we can illustrate in the next slide. Don't do this. This is a video, but I, I, I didn't, I, we were afraid the video wouldn't run, so I broke it into two uh, slides in the next slide. Do you want to try it, Dan, or you want to skip it? Here we go. So basically what happens is, is that low curb, in this case it's a mountable curb, gives that um, outside front tire just enough of a bounce to get um, the passenger vehicle up and over uh, the curb. So instead of, instead of deflecting off of the higher wall, it launches over it and then in this case hits the fixed barrier. Um, you know, this design doesn't have that. It's designed to interact with the bumper to deflect, not to not to have you climb over. Okay. Um, just more on landscaping. I'm going to kind of move along because I think we're getting short on time. But basically, um, low plants are the best. All right. Um, think about your maintenance when you design these things. You might go bigger than the minimum for the, the ADA or the pedestrian need if, if you can get your, your sweepers um, in there as well. So it's just another design consideration, okay? And, uh, you know, landscaping can be used as a barrier. Um, you know, if you have holly or something that's particularly prickly, um, you need to make sure that if you're going to do this, that if a pedestrian leaves a place of safety and gets to that median, that they can still have a safe place to hang out there, figure out that their path is blocked, and then, and then get back. Um, what you don't want to do is strand somebody out there or have them now stuck in the roadway because you're making the situation worse. Um, a lot of times, though, you need a, a physical railing to let the landscape barrier establish itself. And then, of course, there's a the maintenance uh, responsibility there as well. Okay? And this uh, just shows you that you can put uh, fences in the median. Again, they need to be crash-worthy or outside the clear zone uh, or both. And and you're in higher speed roads, that starts to create some constraints against your medium width. Also considering uh, visibility for motorists. You know, typically this top rail is sort of the problematic element in the crashworthiness. And so uh, a lot of times you see designs that are more, they almost look like bike racks, they're more loopy. 
um, so that you don't have that rail that can come in and spear somebody. And the reasons you do this are when you have sort of a broader sheet flow of pedestrians and you really need to channelize them to either a crosswalk or an overpass. Let's go to the next slide. Or you get things like this, yeah. So that's not good. Let's move along. So this is an example where you have an arena. You had sheet flow pedestrians in and out. Uh, the overpass was put in. Let's make the pedestrians safe. Um, you know, that still wasn't working. They had uh, police out there during events. It still wasn't working. And so the median barrier was installed. Uh, there's still uh, enforcement at either end, but it's a much smaller area to patrol, and now the compliance is much better. And we know this is a drawback of, of um, you know, pedestrian overpasses are expensive and people don't use them, but with the channelization, uh, you know, you can get the value out of those things. And again, this is a special event location. Um, signalization, the signal should be times the pedestrians can get all the way across. If the street's too wide to accommodate that, uh, the meter needs to be wide enough to accommodate a two-stage crossing. Um, minimum of six feet, I would say eight to ten feet. I don't know if I'd go as far to say preferred, but, um, you know, you can do it. But one of those nice 16 or 20 foot medians would be even better if you're going to really plan for a two-stage crossing. Um, and so, um, your crossing distance has to do with cycle length and distance to near signal and a couple other considerations. Uh, for two-stage crossings, of course, the pedestrian push button must also be installed in the median, uh, and you might consider accessible pedestrian uh, signal push buttons as well. Just some uh, ideas that you can have a median that separates um, parking from a through lane. So there's some different approaches. Um, if you're going to have parking in the median, then you need to have a sidewalk so that people that get out of their car can walk along the median to a, a safe crossing location rather than have to cross wherever they are. Okay, next. Uh, lighting is critical. Um, there's a, a informational guide on uh, Federal Highway has on, on lighting for mid-level crosswalks, and basically the idea is that the lighting be on both sides of the road, and it should be uh, somewhat in advance of the crosswalk. Okay. And so this is the thing I just mentioned. Um, it's a good reference that talks about the minimum uh, levels of illumination and, and placement. So that's there at the, at the site. All right, next. And this is just an illustration of what it's like. Yeah, and I'll say, uh, Demian, we're actually going to be covering lighting in one of our later uh, in one of our later modules, so we may hold up on some of that content for them. Yeah, that's fine. I think I think that's pretty well done with. Kind of want to um, just speed through to the end. Um, you know, cost is a consideration. This depends on landscaping, um, how you need to do it. But um, from ten to forty thousand dollars for a basic island, and then you know, if you're putting in lighting features and, and hybrid beacons and things, the cost can be much higher, up to a hundred, hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. Okay. Um, you know, here when you no longer use the median, you need to think about uh, this is sort of a continuation of the emergency vehicle conversation from earlier. Uh, you know, dealing with U-turns, dealing with uh, maintenance if you're if you're pumping out uh, storm drains, things like that. How does the median impact your maintenance of traffic for those things? Again, it's usually not a reason to prohibit the, the median island. It's more uh, something that you need to consider in your design and coordination. May mean going to maintenance some night, which might cost you more. Things like that. Um, if you're going to put in a continuous um, median island, a raised median, more than an island, um, then you need to discourage U-turns where you don't have enough width to accomplish it, and then make sure there are points where U-turns can be accommodated. Um, here, an emergency vehicle can run over these delineators and then replace. So those are some just different things to get in there, um, or they can be used across a point. We've I got, think. Uh, uh, Demian, at this point, um, we, we may actually think about skipping over this last case study in favor of maybe doing some questions. If yeah, you're all right I think that's, that. yeah, that's a good idea. Let's do that. So we've got this. Um, the case study slides will be in the uh, online, so you can go check those out. They're pretty cool pictures of a case study from Washington uh, State. Uh, I believe that's where it's from. So uh, check that out. You know, it might provide another a bit of inspiration. But um, in the interest of time, I wanted to go ahead and get through some of the, some of the questions. Demian, you did a great job hitting, I think, most of the issues that came up in the, in the questions that were submitted, especially before the webinar. Um, it seems like a lot of people, you know, the designs are all very straightforward. You know, there are a lot of good requirements and resources out there. 
for guidance. Um, some of the issues people are struggling with is, you know, how to overcome that op that uh, opposition to some of these projects, specifically things that are restricting vehicle movement. You know, we didn't get in too much into access management. You're talking about restricting driveway movements and um, and left turn movements out of out of driveways, things like that. I mean, any strategies that you can recommend, or, or any maybe uh, arguments that that can kind of um, help convince people that these are the right thing to do. Yeah, I, I think you know that is a big issue. It's something that we deal with when we're trying to put these in. I think you know your your first best bet is to um, see what you can do with the design itself to to limit that. Um, typically, you know retailers are more concerned with getting people into their establishment than getting them out again. Uh, it sounds a little bit cynical, but if you can preserve the access in, um, you know sometimes that's better than nothing. So the first step is the design strategy. I think, I think the second step is to absolutely document uh, the safety need. Um, you know, it's a lot easier to make the case when you have um, a documented crash history. Everybody's laws and, and states are different as you know, to sort of who's, who and how much do you have to, to um, you know, access management laws are different in different states, but generally if you do uh, completely impact somebody's access, um, you know, there can be legal ramifications, and so that's a, a tricky subject. I think um, you can look at it long term. You can say maybe we can't do it today, but as uh, property comes in to rezone or to redevelop, uh, we definitely want to put this on the list. I mean, that's sort of your worst case scenario is that you have to wait for some um, private property action on the part of the, the property owner to say, well, listen, we're happy to rezone this, but now we need to come in and get what we wanted. And so that's more of a longer term uh, planning strategy, but that's one way to deal with it. Yeah, and I mean, I, I like your, your pointing out toward the beginning of the presentation about using, um, using temporary treatments and maybe testing out and trial running some of these things to maybe using that opportunity to show people that it can work uh, before you go all the way in. Maybe an easier sell than, than uh, you know, installing the medians and then hoping for the best. Yeah, and I think, I think you have to have a good case, too, with the pedestrian flow. Sometimes we're putting the median islands out there and we're making them available for the pedestrians that choose to use them, knowing full well that some pedestrians are going to continue to kind of just sheet flow and cross wherever. And I think if you're going to get into a real fight with a, specifically it's a business, if you're going to get into a real uh, mix-up with a business over the placement of an island, you, you need to be a little bit more certain in that, that it is addressing a desire line. Ideally, if you can make the case that it's, it's your customers, it's your employees that this is benefiting, then uh, you know, that, that may help as well. Yeah. Although that, um, that's yeah, I was just going to say, uh, you know, uh, Peter, Peter, on, you know, you're still on the line, I believe, and you've taught as many of these courses as as, uh, as any of us have. I, I wonder if there are any issues, uh, questions that typically come up uh, that that we didn't address here that you might uh, have for Demian or or, or, or uh, raise any any other points. Uh, no, I just wanted to reiterate. Uh, I thought the point about safety. Um, one of the things that uh, you know, a lot of times people who don't want access to or limit the access to their business, they don't really know the safety numbers. And so going to them and actually showing them the data and explaining to them why, um, I think that would definitely, we've had some uh, case studies or some situations where that's turned the people around and then they're uh, for the project. So sometimes people just aren't knowledgeable. They think that was a great answer. And um, I think, you know, we covered uh, this 201 series is really to, um, you know, a continuation of the 101 and trying to get more details to some of the specifics that we, you know, the type of questions that we have in the 101. And so I think they I mean, did a good job with uh, covering those. So. Thanks, Peter. And just on that last topic, when you, when you make the safety case, um, you know, we showed that Eureka, California example. It was really the motor vehicle crashes that the island mitigated as much as it was providing a safe place for pedestrians. And so don't just look at the pedestrian safety issue, look at the overall motor vehicle traffic safety issue when you're making the case for these things. That's great. Thanks, thanks to both of you for that. Um, I, unfortunately, you know, we don't have a whole lot more time for questions. Um, I've got our email address up here on the screen. Um, I'd encourage you, if you have uh, remaining questions that you have or things we didn't quite get to, please uh, contact us and let us know. We'd be happy to respond to those or point you in the right direction. Um, also mention another resource you might look at for, for this and other treatments. Uh, we've got the, the recently updated uh, PedSafe resource up that you can, down, you can look at um, all the information about countermeasures, case studies, things like that, and some, some of the background research 
on these different countermeasures. Um, if you go to pedbikesafe.org, uh, that'll lead you right to PedSafe and BikeSafe as well. So a lot of good countermeasure information there. Uh, in addition to all these other resources that Demian shared, and again, you can look back at those slides and take a look at some of the reference points, uh, dig into that other information. Uh, there's a lot to get through, and Demian did a great job today of kind of taking on this, this marathon topic and, and pull, pulling us through all this content. So um, with that being said, um, I'd like to uh, remind everybody again um, that you're going to get an email later today, or the person who registered for the webinar will get that email with the uh, certificate of attendance download instructions, as well as a link to the archive page where you can download the slides, and then in about a week or two you can find the video uh, archive of this webinar if you want to refer back to it. Um, once you leave the webinar today, you're going to see a very brief survey. Uh, it'll appear right when you close out. Uh, we would really appreciate your feedback uh, on today's webinar. Uh, you know, we have 11 more of these as part of this series, so things we can do to improve uh, the webinars and, and uh, even add uh, topics to our future list of webinars that we deliver. I'd uh, be very uh, interested to hear that from you. So if you can participate in that survey, uh, we would really appreciate it. Um, I want to say uh, thanks again uh, to Demian Miller for delivering today's uh, presentation, uh, and thanks to all of you for attending today's PBIC webinar, and I hope you have a great day.